false trends in modern teaching, encyclical letter Humani Generis, of His Holiness Pius XII, by Divine Providence Pope, to His Worshipful Brethren the Patriarchs, Primates, Archbishops, Bishops, and all other local ordinaries that are in peace and in communion with the Apostolic See, concerning certain false opinions which threaten to sap the foundation of Catholic teaching. This edition is the translation by Monsignor Ronald Knox. Worshipful Brethren, Health and Apostolic Benediction Introduction Doctrinal Errors Outside the Church and the Effects Among Catholics Section Heading Why There Have Always Been Errors Outside the Church It has ever been a cause of deep and heartfelt sorrow to honest folk, and above all to good, loyal sons of the Church, that the judgments of mankind in the sphere of religion and morals should be so variable and so apt to stray from the truth. And today, when the very elements of Christian culture are being openly attacked on all sides, this sorrow is felt with unwonted force. That such disagreement, such false tendencies, should always have been common outside the Christian fold is no matter for astonishment. In the abstract, to be sure, man's reason is genuinely capable of apprehending certain truths by its own natural power, its own natural light. It can have well-grounded and certain knowledge about the existence of one God, a personal being, who watches over and controls the world by his providence, about the existence of a natural law written in our hearts by him who created us. But this inborn faculty, can it be used effectively, can it produce results? There are many obstacles to be encountered. The truths we have to learn about God and about the relations between God and man are truths which wholly transcend this visible order of things. And truths of that kind, if they are to be translated into human action and influence human action, call for self-surrender and self-sacrifice. Meanwhile, the human mind is hampered in the attaining of such truths not only by the impact of the senses and the imagination, but by disordered appetites, which are the consequences of the fall. What wonder if men who are faced by such problems persuade themselves all too readily that any conclusion which is unwelcome to them personally is groundless or at best uncertain. We have to admit, then, the moral necessity of a revelation from God. Without that, Religious and moral truths, which of their own nature lie within the scope of human reason, cannot be apprehended promptly, with full certainty, and without some alloy of error in the present state of mankind. It is the same with the Catholic faith. It is sometimes not without difficulty that a man makes up his mind in favor of his credentials. True, God has provided us with an amazing wealth of external evidence by which the divine origins of the Christian religion can be brought home beyond question, even to the unaided light of reason. But a man may be so blinded by prejudice, so much at the mercy of his passions and his animosity, that he can shake his head and remain unmoved, not only the evidence of external proofs, which is plain to the view, but even the heavenly inspirations which God conveys to our minds can go for nothing. Section heading, Present Day Fallacies. A glance at the world outside the Christian fold will familiarize us easily enough with the false directions which the thought of the learned often takes. Some will contend that the theory of evolution, as it is called, a theory which has not yet been proved beyond contradiction, even in the sphere of natural science, applies to the origin of all things whatsoever. Accepting it without caution, without reservation, they boldly give rein to monistic or pantheistic speculations which represent the whole universe as left at the mercy of a continual process of evolution. Such speculations are eagerly welcomed by the communists who find in them a powerful weapon for defending and popularizing their system of dialectical materialism. The whole idea of God is thus to be eradicated from men's minds. 
These false evolutionary notions, with the denial of all that is absolute or fixed or abiding in human experience, have paved the way for a new philosophy of error. Idealism, immanentism, pragmatism have now a rival in what is called existentialism. Its method, as the name implies, is to leave the unchanging essences of things out of sight and to concentrate all its attention on particular existences. <coughs> there is, too, a false use of the historical method, which confines its observations to the actual happenings of human life and, in doing so, contrives to undermine all absolute truth, all absolute laws, whether it is dealing with the problems of philosophy or with the doctrines of the Christian religion. Amid all this welter of speculations, we find some comfort in the contemplation of a different school of thinkers. Not a few of the moderns, reacting from the dogmas of the rationalism in which they were brought up, are thirsting afresh for the wells of divine revelation. They recognize and proclaim the word of God, preserved for us in Holy Scripture, as the foundation of Christian teaching. But many of them, alas, in their determination to hold fast by God's word, banish the exercise of human reason. The more loudly they extol the authority of God revealing, the more bitter is their contempt for the teaching office of the Church, although our Lord Jesus Christ himself instituted this as the means by which the truths God has revealed should be safeguarded and interpreted. This attitude of theirs is flatly contradicted by Scripture itself, and its falsehood is further demonstrated by experience. How often it has happened that men who revolted against the Church fall out among themselves and complain so openly of their divisions that they are forced against their wills to admit the necessity of a living teacher. Section heading, The Effects of These Fallacies Among Catholics all this, evidently, concerns our own Catholic theologians and philosophers. They have a grave responsibility for defending truth, both divine and human, and for instilling it into men's minds. They must needs acquaint themselves with all these speculations, to a more or less extent erroneous. They must needs take them into account. Nay, it is their duty to have a thorough understanding of them. There is no curing a disease unless you have made a study of its symptoms. Moreover, there is some truth underlying even these wrong-headed ideas. Yes, and they spur the mind on to study and to weigh certain truths, philosophical and theological, more carefully than we otherwise should. If this were all, if our philosophers and theologians promised themselves no more than this from a careful study of such doctrines, there would be no need for the Church's authority to put in a word of warning. We are satisfied that Catholic teachers in general keep clear of these errors. But it is certain that there are others, now as in the time of the Apostles, who have too ready an ear for novelties. Perhaps, too, they are afraid of seeming ill-informed about the progress which science has made in our day. At any rate, they are eager to emancipate themselves from authority, and the danger is that they will lose touch by insensible degrees with the truth divinely revealed to us, leading others besides themselves into error. But we are faced by another danger too, all the more formidable, because it is disguised under the cloak of good intentions. There are not a few who, grieved at this worldwide disagreement and misunderstanding, have been led astray by an indiscreet zeal for souls. They have an itch, nay, they have a burning desire to break down all the barriers by which men of goodwill are now separated from one another. They embrace a policy of appeasement which would fain put on one side all the questions that divide us, not merely to the extent of uniting forces against the common menace of atheism, but actually so as to achieve a compromise of opinion even where matters of doctrine are concerned. There have been thinkers before now who doubted whether the Church's traditional system of apologetics was not a hindrance rather than a help in winning souls for Christ. And so it is with these moderns. They go so far, some of them, as to raise serious doubts about our theology 
and its whole method, as these now find favour in our schools with the encouragement of ecclesiastical authority. The demand is not yet for the higher development of these, but for their wholesale reform. This, we are told, would make for a more effective spread of Christ's kingdom all the world over, among men of whatever culture, of whatever religious opinions. If nothing more was suggested than some readjustment in the ecclesiastical sciences and their methods, which would better adapt them to the needs and conditions of our time, there would be no cause for alarm. But the hot-headed supporters of appeasement are not content with that. They see obstacles to the restoration of brotherly unity everywhere, even in claims that are founded upon the very laws and principles which Christ gave us, even in the institutions he himself founded. Yet what are these but the bulwarks which protect the faith in its entirety? Let those fall, and the world may indeed be united, but only in a common ruin. Some of these innovating notions arise from an unwholesome itch for modernity. Some are inspired by motives praiseworthy in themselves. Not all are carried to the same lengths, not all expressed in the same unambiguous terms, and those who hold them are not always in full agreement with one another. But this only means that the views which are put forward obscurely today, hedged about with safeguards and distinctions, will be proclaimed tomorrow by other bolder spirits openly and extravagantly. Many, among the younger clergy especially, will be led astray by this bad example, and church discipline will suffer. In published works, some caution is still observed, but more freedom is shown in books privately circulated, in lectures and in meetings for discussion. And it is not only in clerical gatherings, secular or religious, not only in the seminary and the cloister that such views are aired. They are heard among the laity, and especially in the teaching profession. Part 1. The New Tendencies in Theology. Section heading, The Danger of Dogmatic Relativism. What do they make of theology? Some are for whittling away the meaning of doctrines to the utmost possible limit. Dogma must be disentangled from the forms of expression which have so long been accepted in the schools, from the philosophical notions which find favour with Catholic teachers. There must be a return in our exposition of Catholic doctrine to the language of Scripture and of the Fathers. Privately, they cherish the hope that dogma, when thus stripped of the elements which they regard as external to divine revelation, may be usefully compared with the theological opinions of other bodies separated from the unity of the Church. This might lead, by degrees, to a levelling up between Catholic doctrine and the views of those who disagree with us. There is more. When Catholic teaching has been restored to this model, they see the way made clear for restating dogma in terms of modern philosophy, immanentism, idealism, existentialism, or what other system you will, and so meeting the needs of the day. As for the bolder spirits, they will tell you this is by right and natural. After all, the mysteries of the faith can never be expressed in terms which, which exhaust the truth, only in approximate terms, perpetually needing revision, which adumbrate the truth up to a point, but suffer inevitably from a kind of refraction. There's no absurdity then, they say, Rather, there's a strict necessity about the idea that theology should constantly be exchanging old concepts for new, as times keep on altering, and it finds, in the gradual development of philosophy, new tools ready to its hand. The same divine truth, they tell us, may be expressed on the human side in two different ways, nay, in two ways which in a sense contradict one another, and yet really mean the same thing. And they go on to say that the history of dogma consists in that and nothing else, in giving some account of the various successive forms under which revealed truth has appeared, corresponding to the various theories and speculations which the centuries have brought with them. It will be clear from all we have been saying that the efforts made by these thinkers not merely lead to what is called relativism in doctrinal theology, 
was already involved. Is not this amply borne out by the contempt they show for the teaching commonly handed down and for the terms which enshrine it? To be sure, all are agreed that the terms representing certain ideas, however much they may have been used in the schools and even in the authoritative teaching of the Church, are nevertheless susceptible of further perfecting and polishing. It is notorious that the Church has not always been consistent in the use of the same identical phrases. It is evident, too, that the Church cannot be tied down to any philosophy which has had a brief moment of popularity. But the framework which has been built up over a course of centuries by the common consent of Catholic teachers in the effort to reach truth about such and such a doctrine cannot be dismissed as resting on a flimsy foundation of that sort. It rests on principles, on ideas, which have been inferred from a just apprehension of created things. And in the making of such inferences, the star of truth, divinely revealed, have shone out to the human mind through the Church's agency. No wonder if some of these conceptions have been used and hallowed in their use by the general councils, after such a fashion that they cannot, without impiety, be abandoned. So numerous they are, and so important, these theological concepts, which have been hammered out and polished with the utmost care in order to express with ever-increasing accuracy the truths in which we believe. It is a process that has often cost centuries of labor, carried out by men of no common intellectual attainments, under the watchful eye of authority, with light and leading too from the Holy Spirit. Must they now fall into disuse, be cast aside, be robbed of all their meaning? Are we to substitute for them guesswork of our own, vague and impermanent fashions of speech, borrowed from our up-to-date philosophies, which today live and will feed the oven tomorrow? That were, indeed, the height of imprudence. The whole of dogma would thus become no better than a reed shaken by the wind. Treat with disrespect the terms and concepts which have been used by scholastic theologians, and the result, inevitably, is to take all the force out of what is called speculative theology. It rests entirely on theological reasoning, and so, for these modern thinkers, has no real validity. Section heading, False Notion About the Teaching Authority Sad to say, these innovators are easily led on from contempt of scholastic theology into forgetting or even despising the authority of the Church itself which has so committed itself to the theology in question. Authority, by their way of it, is a drag on progress, is a bar to the development of science. There are some non-Catholics who think of it as a bridle, which forcibly restrains some few enlightened theologians from revolutionizing the whole system they teach. Is not this authority a sacred trust? an exact and all-embracing standard of measurement which every theologian must use? Has not our Lord Christ committed to it the task of guarding, preserving, interpreting the whole deposit of faith, not only sacred scripture, but the tradition which is no less divine in origin? Have not the faithful a duty of shunning even those errors which approximate in a more or less degree to heresy, and therefore of obeying even those regulations and decrees by which the Holy See stigmatizes such false opinions and forbids the propagation of them. Yet the very existence of such a duty sometimes goes unremarked. Let Roman pontiffs write encyclicals as they will about the nature and constitution of the Church. There are some who are determined to take no notice. They aim at giving currency instead to certain vague ideas on the subject derived, as they claim, from the ancient fathers, the Greek fathers particularly. The popes, they will tell you, have no intention of deciding upon questions which are in dispute among theologians. We must go back to primitive sources and interpret these new decrees, these new regulations, in the light of what was written long ago. A joint reasoning, but there's a fallacy in it. It is quite true as a general principle 
that the Popes give theologians full liberty of speculation over questions which are variously answered by doctors of repute. But history teaches us that many propositions which were at one time freely discussed have afterwards been settled beyond the possibility of dispute. Nor is it to be supposed that a position advanced in an encyclical does not ipso facto claim assent. In writing them it is true the popes do not exercise their teaching authority to the full. But such statements come under the day-to-day -day teaching of the Church, which is covered by the promise, He who listens to you listens to me. For the most part, the positions advanced, the duties inculcated by these encyclical letters, are already bound up under some other title with the general body of Catholic teaching. And when the Roman pontiffs go out of their way to pronounce on some subject which has hitherto been controverted, it must be clear to everybody that in the mind and intention of the pontiffs concerned, this subject can no longer be regarded as a matter of free debate among theologians. True again that a theologian must constantly be having recourse to the fountains of divine revelation. It is for him to show how and where the teaching given by the living voice of the Church is contained in the Scripture and in our sacred tradition, be it explicitly or implicitly to be found there. This twofold spring of doctrine, divinely made known to us, contains, in any case, treasures so varied and so rich that it must ever prove inexhaustible. That is why the study of these hallowed sources gives the sacred sciences a kind of perpetual youth. Avoid the labor of probing deeper and deeper yet into the sacred deposit, and your speculations, experience shows it, grow barren. All that is true, but for that very reason, theology, even what is called positive theology, must not be put on a level with the merely historical sciences. Side by side with these hallowed sources, God has given his church a living voice. Thus he would make clear to us, unravel for us, even what was left obscure in the deposit of faith, and only present there implicitly. The task of interpreting the deposit aright was not entrusted by our divine Redeemer to the individual Christian, nor even to the individual theologian. It was the church's teaching that must be decisive. And when the Church exercises this privilege, as it often has in past ages, whether it be exercised in the way of routine or upon some special occasion, it is plainly wrong to treat its decisions as these people do. They actually use what is obscure to explain what is lucidly clear, as if the opposite procedure does not plainly impose itself on all minds. No wonder that our predecessor of undying memory Pius IX, in laying it down that the tracing of the Church's defined doctrines to their source was the noblest office of theology, added certain words of grave but necessary warning. In no other sense, he wrote, than that in which they have been defined by the Church. Section heading, Mistakes about the Interpretation of the Scriptures. To go back to those modern speculations which you mentioned just now, much that is maintained, much that is insinuated by some of these teachers is injurious to the divine authority of sacred scripture. There are those who boldly pervert the sense of the definition laid down by the Vatican Council as to its divine authorship. They bring up again the old argument, so often censured, which contends that the inerrancy of scripture only extends to what it tells us about God, about morals, and about religion. They even use misguided language about the human meaning of the sacred books, under which a divine meaning is concealed, and only this divine meaning, they claim, is infallible. In their interpretation of Scripture, they will not take into account the harmony of, re of revealed truths with one another, nor pay any attention to the tradition of the Church. They will make of Holy Scripture, as scholars interpret it each after his own human fashion, a balance 
by which they can assay the teaching of the fathers and of the church, when they ought to be interpreting Holy Scripture according to the mind of the church, since the church, by our Lord Christ's own appointment, is authorized to guard and to interpret the whole deposit of divine revelation. What of the literal sense of Scripture? What of the interpretation it has received from so many great scholars under the watchful eye of the Church? All that goes for nothing, these false teachers are agreed. It must make way for a new kind of exegesis, which they are fain to call symbolic or spiritual. Under this treatment, the sacred books of the Old Testament, a sealed fountain till now, hidden away under the Church's guardianship, will at last yield their message to us all. And thus, they tell us, all the difficulties will disappear, difficulties which are felt to be so only by those who cling to a literal interpretation. Nobody can fail to see how ill all this accords with the principles and rules of interpretation which have been solemnly laid down by our predecessors of happy memory. By Leo XIII in his encyclical Providentissimus, by Benedict, by Benedict XV in Spiritus Paracletus, and by ourselves in Divina Afflante Spiritu. Section heading, Some Specific Theological Errors. No wonder if this spirit of innovation has already borne poisonous fruit in almost every sphere of theology. A doubt is raised whether the human reason, unaided by God's revelation and by his grace, can really prove the existence of a personal God by inference from the facts of creation. We are told that the world had no beginning, that its creation was a necessary event, owing its origin to an act of liberality which the divine love could not refuse. So too, God is no longer credited with an infallible foreknowledge from all eternity of our free human acts. All this is contrary to the declarations made by the Council of the Vatican. Are the angels, we are asked, personal beings? Is there any essential difference between matter and spirit? Others destroy the gratuitous character of the supernatural order by suggesting that it would be impossible for God to create rational beings without ordaining them for the beatific vision and calling them to it. Not content with that, they throw over the definitions of the Council of Trent by misrepresenting the whole nature of original sin, and indeed of sin in general, considered as an offence against God. The whole nature, too, of the satisfaction which Christ offered on our behalf. You will find men arguing that the doctrine of transubstantiation ought to be revised, depending as it does on a conception of substance which is now out of date. The real presence of Christ in the Holy Eucharist is thus reduced to a kind of symbolic communication, the consecrated species being no more than an effectual sign of Christ's spiritual presence and of his close union with his faithful members in the mystical body. That the mystical body of Christ and the Catholic Church in communion with Rome are one and the same thing is a doctrine based on revealed truth and as such was set forth by us in an encyclical a few years back. Some imagine, nevertheless, that they are not bound to hold it, that we must needs belong to the true Church if we are to attain everlasting salvation, is a statement which some reduce to an empty formula. Others, again, belittle the reasoning process by which we accept the credentials of the Christian faith. It is beyond doubt that these notions and others of the same kind are creeping in among certain children of ours who have been led astray either by indiscreet zeal for souls or by views which idly claim to be called scientific. We are reluctantly forced to dwell once more on truths which are so widely known and call attention, not without anxiety, to falsehoods and approaches to falsehood which are so manifest. Please stop the machine and turn the cassette over at this point without rewinding. The program continues on the second side. 
Part 2. The Field of Philosophy. Section Heading. Natural Reason and the Basic Principles of Philosophy. Notoriously, the Church makes much of human reason in the following connections. When we establish beyond doubt the existence of one God who is a personal being. When we establish irrefutably by the proofs divinely granted to us the basic facts on which the Christian faith itself rests. When we give just expression to the natural law which the Creator has implanted in men's hearts. And finally, when we would attain what understanding we can, and it's a most fruitful kind of understanding, of the divine mysteries. But if reason is to perform this office adequately and without fear of error, it must be trained on the right principles. It must be steeped in that sound philosophy which we have long possessed as an heirloom handed down to us by former ages of Christendom. Actually, it enjoys a higher degree of credit. The principles on which it is based, and the chief assertions which it makes, have not only been laid bare and clearly set forth, century after century, by men of the highest gifts, the teaching authority of the Church has gone further and brought them to the touchstone of divine revelation. What is the character of the philosophy which the Church thus recognizes and receives? It upholds the real, genuine validity of human thought processes. It upholds the unassailable principles of metaphysics, sufficient reason, causality, and finality. It upholds the possibility of arriving at certain and unalterable truth. There is much in the tenets of this philosophy which does not touch, either directly or indirectly, the provinces of faith and morals. All this the Church leaves open to free discussion among the learned. But this liberty cannot be claimed over a multitude of other points, and notably over the main principles it rests on, the main assertions it makes, as we have outlined them above. Where these all-important questions are concerned, what progress is possible? You may deck out philosophy in more elaborate garments, and such as are more becoming to it. You may fortify it with more telling terminology. You may relieve it of an ill-conceived argument here and there, which the schoolmen have brought forward in its defence. You may enrich it, if due caution be observed, with certain new elements, which the progress of human thought has brought with it. But whatever you do, you must not uproot it. You must not adulterate it with false principles. You must not treat it as an interesting ruin. Truth, and the philosophic expression of truth, cannot change in a night. We are dealing with those principles of thought which impose themselves in their own right on the human mind. We are speaking of conclusions which are based on the wisdom of the ages and, for that matter, on the coincident support of divine revelation. The mind of man, when it is engaged in a sincere search for truths, will never light on one which contradicts the truths it has already ascertained. God is truth itself. He it is who has created and who directs the human intellect. He does not mean it to be contrasting each day that passes some new point of view with one it has already solidly acquired. He means it to eliminate any error that may have entered into its calculations and then to build up new truth on the foundation of the old. That is the order of nature's own architecture and it is from nature that we derive our knowledge of truth. It is not for the Christian, be he theologian or philosopher, to give every latest fantasy of the day a thoughtless and hasty welcome. He will weigh carefully and with a just balance, making sure that he does not lose hold of the truth already in his possession or contaminate it in any way, with great danger and perhaps great loss to the faith itself. Section heading, Respect for Scholastic Philosophy. In view of all this, it is not surprising that the Church will have its future priests brought up on a philosophy which derives its method, its system, and its basic principles from the angelic doctor.
that is, he means St. Thomas Aquinas. One thing is clearly established by the long experience of the ages, that St. Thomas's philosophical system is an unrivaled method, either for putting the beginner through his paces or for the investigation of the most recondite truths. Moreover, that his teaching seems to chime in by a kind of pre-established harmony with the divine revelation. No surer way to safeguard the first principles of the faith and turn the results of later healthier developments to good advantage. Deplorable that a philosophy thus recognized and received by the Church should in our day be treated by some minds with contempt. Its, its style, these unblushing critics inform us, is out of date. Its thought processes are too closely wedded to reason. They will have it that this philosophy of ours takes up a false position in asserting the existence of absolute truth in metaphysics. Ought we not rather to say that our ideas, at least of transcendental being, can only be represented with accuracy by a series of isolated propositions which are complementary to one another and yet, in a sense, contradict one another. The philosophic tradition of the schools, with its clear exposition of problems and the solution it gives to them, its nice definition of concepts and all the distinction it introduces, may have been well enough as a preparation for scholastic theology not ill-suited to the medieval mind, it does not match the culture or meet the needs of our own day. An unaging philosophy, rather one which deals only with the immutable essence of things, whereas the mind of today is forced back on the contemplation of separate existences of a world in continual flux. So contemptuous of ours, they will cry up other philosophies, new or old, from the East or from the West, with the implication that any system of speculation can be harmonized with Catholic doctrines when you've added a few corrections, filled in a few gaps. Every Catholic knows this to be a palpable illusion, at least if it be applied to immanentism and idealism, to materialism, historical or dialectic, and to existentialism, whether it denies God's existence or merely the validity of metaphysical reasoning. Another flaw they find in scholasticism is that in analyzing our thought processes, it only takes reason into account, leaving the functions of the will and the affections on one side. This is contrary to fact. Never did the Christian philosophy deny that a right disposition of the whole mind has a decisive value in helping us to penetrate and assimilate moral and religious truths. Indeed, it is always taught that the want of such dispositions can be the cause of error. The intellect is so blinded by the appetites and by prejudice that it cannot see straight. Nay, St. Thomas is of the opinion that the intellect can have some perception of what is best in the moral order, whether natural or supernatural. It experiences a sort of kinship with such high things, whether natural or grace-given. And such a perception, however indefinite, can evidently be of great assistance in our intellectual inquiries. But that is only to say that our affections, that the attitude of our wills, can be of assistance to the reason in acquiring a more certain and stable knowledge of truths that lie in the moral order. The claim which these innovators make is something quite other. They attribute to our affections, to our appetitive nature, a kind of intuitive faculty, so that a man who cannot make up his mind what is the true answer to some intellectual problem need only have recourse to his will. The will makes a free choice between two intellectual alternatives. A strange confusion here between the provinces of thought and of volition. When such opinions are abroad, it's not surprising that two branches of philosophical study, both intimately bound up with the faith, should be called in question, natural theology and ethics. Not for these, they tell us, to offer any demonstrative proof about God 
or about any other transcendental subject. All they can do is to show us how exactly the teachings of the faith about a personal God and about his commandments fit in with the demands which life makes on us. And to indicate the acceptance of those teachings as the only alternative to despair, the only hope of salvation. All this runs clean contrary to the warnings of our predecessors, Leo XIII and Pius X. Nor can it be really reconciled with the decrees of the Vatican Council. There would be no need to reprobate such errors if the teaching of the Church were as carefully observed as it ought to be in matters of philosophy. Its divine institution has entrusted to it a further duty besides that of guarding and interpreting the deposit of revelation, philosophy too must come under its watchful care. Otherwise the whole of Catholic doctrine may be undermined by false assumptions. Part 3. The Faith and the Positive Sciences Biology and Anthropology Evolution and Polygenism it remains to say something about further difficulties concerned with the positive sciences, as they are called, and yet connected in a more or less degree with the truths of the Christian faith. Some thinkers allowed in their demand that the Catholic religion should make these sciences of the greatest possible account, an excellent principle where it is a question of really ascertained facts. But what of hypotheses, based to some extent on natural science, which yet affect the doctrines enshrined in scripture and in tradition. Here we must be cautious. Where such conjectures are directly or indirectly opposed to the truths God has revealed, the claim is inadmissible. Thus, the teaching of the Church leaves the doctrine of evolution an open question, as long as it confines its speculations to the development from other living matter already in existence of the human body. That souls are immediately created by God is a view which the Catholic faith imposes on us. In the present state of scientific and theological opinion, this question may be legitimately canvassed by research and by discussion between those who are expert in both subjects. At the same time, the reasons for and against either view must be weighed and adjudged with all seriousness, fairness and restraint and there must be a readiness on all sides to accept the arbitrament of the Church as being entrusted by Christ with the task of interpreting the Scriptures aright and the duty of safeguarding the doctrines of the faith. There are some who take rash advantage of this liberty of debate by treating the subject as if the whole matter were closed, as if the discoveries hitherto made and the arguments based on them were sufficiently certain to prove beyond doubt the development of the human body from other living matter already in existence. They forget, too, that there are certain references to the subject in the sources of divine revelation, which call for the greatest caution and prudence in discussing it. There are other conjectures about polygenism, as it is called, which leave the faithful no such freedom of debate. Christians cannot lend their support to a theory which involves the existence, after Adam's time, of some earthly race of men, truly so-called, who are not descended ultimately from him, or else supposes that Adam was the name given to some group of our primordial ancestors. It does not appear how such views can be reconciled with the doctrine of original sin, as this is guaranteed to us by scripture and tradition, and proposed to us by the Church. Original sin is the result of a sin committed in actual historical fact by an individual man named Adam, and it is a quality native to all of us, only because it has been handed down by descent from him. Section heading, History, the first eleven chapters of Genesis. As with biology and anthropology, so with history. There are some who make bold to overstep the warning landmarks which the Church has laid down. One especially regrettable tendency 
is to interpret the historical books of the Old Testament with overmuch freedom. In vain do the exponents of this method appeal for their defense to the letter recently received by the Archbishop of Paris from the Pontifical Commission on Biblical Studies. It was clearly laid down in that letter that the first eleven chapters of Genesis, although it is not right to judge them by modern standards of historical composition, such as would be applied to the great classical authors or to the learned of our own day, do nevertheless come under the heading of history. In what exact sense, it is for further labors of the exegete to determine. These chapters have a naive, symbolical way of talking, well suited to the understanding of a primitive people. But they do disclose to us certain important truths upon which the attainment of our eternal salvation depends. And they do also give a popularly written description of how the human race, and the chosen people in particular, came to be. It may be true that those old writers of sacred history drew some of their material from the stories current among the people of their day. So much may be granted, but it must be remembered on the other side that they did so under the impulse of divine inspiration, which preserved them from all error in selecting and assessing the material they used. These excerpts from current stories, which are found in the sacred books, must not be put on a level with mere myths or with legend in general. Myths arise from the untrammeled exercise of the imagination, whereas in our sacred books, even in the Old Testament, a love of truth and a cult of simplicity shine out in such a way as to put these writers on a demonstrably different level from their profane contemporaries. Conclusion the duties of those in authority and those who teach. We are fully satisfied that the majority of Catholic teachers employed in universities or seminaries or religious houses of study are untouched by these errors, errors which are spread abroad, openly or in secret guise, as the result of an itch for modernity or indiscreet zeal. But we know that up-to-date speculation of this kind may easily attract the unwary. Better to deal promptly with the first symptoms than to seek remedies later on for a disease now firmly established. And so, after careful thought and deliberation in God's sight, we issue this warning. Otherwise, we should not be carrying out the duties of our sacred office. It is a warning addressed to all bishops and all heads of religious orders, and it is meant to weigh seriously on their consciences. We bid them take every possible precaution against the utterance of such opinions in schools, in gatherings for discussions, in writings of whatever sort, and against their being passed on in any fashion, either to clerics or to the faithful at large. Be it known to all who teach in ecclesiastical institutions that they cannot, with a clear conscience, exercise the office so entrusted to them unless they dutifully accept the principles we have here set forth and observe them narrowly in educating their pupils. Mind and heart of their pupils must be impregnated with the same spirit of loyal reverence towards the teaching authority of the Church which they themselves must ever cultivate in the course of their unceasing labors. With all their powers, in a generous spirit of rivalry, let them enlarge the bounds of the sciences they teach, but always with due care not to overstep the limits which we have imposed for the better safeguarding of the truth and of Catholic doctrine. Let them devote careful study to any new problems which our modern culture and the progressive spirit of the age may raise, but with the prudence and the caution which the subject deserves. And never let them be led away by a false spirit of appeasement. Let them not think that disloyal and erring souls can be brought back with happy result into the bosom of the Church unless the whole truth, as it, found, as it finds currency in the Church, is honestly preached to all, without disfigurement, 
without diminution. On that hope we rely, and the zeal which you show in the fulfilment of your pastoral duties encourages us to entertain it. And so, worshipful brethren, we lovingly impart to all of you, and to your clergy and people, the apostolic benediction, the earnest of heavenly blessings, and the sure testimony of our good will. Given at Rome, at St. Peter's, on the twelfth day of August, in the year 1950, the twelfth of our pontificate. Pope Pius the Twelfth. This is a repeat of the beginning of uh, paragraph uh, 36. Thus, the teaching of the Church leaves the doctrine of evolution an open question, as long as it confines its speculations to the development from other living matter already in existence of the human body. That souls are immediately created by God is a view which the Catholic faith imposes on us. In the present state of scientific and theological opinion, this question may be legitimately canvassed by research and by discussion between those who are expert in both subjects.